Our theme for this month is religion and politics. And so I just want to start with a kind of an apology because politics is pretty different around the world and I really only know anything about politics in the United States. So if you are someone who's not in the US and are participating in this worship service, I'm sorry, I hope that some of what I have to say is relevant, maybe even most of what I have to say is relevant, but um, I'm afraid my examples come from the US because that is just what I know. But politics is for everyone, um, so there you have it. Politics and religion. Or in the words of Thomas Jefferson, church and state. Now, we tend to be folks who are pretty clear on the separation of church and state as an important thing, and there are some of us who are maybe less than thrilled in the variety of ways that we currently see religion encroaching into civil matters. The state of Tennessee recently decided that foster agencies could, for religious reasons, refuse to let same-sex couples serve as foster parents. And as I record this, the Supreme Court is considering whether the government should be allowed to fund religious schools. And we have recently come to the conclusion that it is okay for businesses to decide for religious reasons not to serve same-sex couples, to not make a wedding cake for two people who want to get married if for religious reasons the business owner does not approve. And I'm gonna guess that most of us here are none too happy about that. The idea that people could use their religion as a reason to deny people their civil rights, to make a preferential option on the basis of one religion over another. We are guaranteed separation of church and state. But I think we have to be a little bit careful about what the wall of separation between church and state, to use Jefferson's words, really means. Because what we are guaranteed is that the government cannot tell you how to practice your religion. That's the wall. And so you are allowed to practice your religion without government interference. You get to declare what it is that your religion is. For instance, in one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes cartoons, Calvin is dragged from a classroom declaring, but smearing myself with paste and burning the teacher in effigy is prayer in my religion. You get to choose your religion. But here's the thing about the separation of church and state. It's a wall that goes one way. The state, the government is not allowed to impose your religion but it doesn't mean that your religion is not allowed to impact the state, to impact the government. Because to outlaw that would be impossible. Religion is about values. Who we are as religious people shapes what we do, how we think, how we choose. And government, the state is our work, the work of the people. If you live in a democracy, then you participate in the political process with the values that you have as the person that you are. The politics, the politis is the citizenry, the people. And so who we are as religious people cannot help but shape who we are as political people. It's a matter of salvation because for us, you use salvation isn't just a personal thing. Back with our universalist forebearers, we concluded that 
salvation was not about saving people from a hell that we did not believe in. Salvation is something different. Salvation is a process, something that happens during life. In the Christian tradition, you might call it building the kingdom of God. In the Jewish tradition, you might call it tikkun olam, repairing the world. But that is for us salvation. The things that we do together to preserve life, to care for one another, to make things right. And if we don't do that, we're not practicing our religion. There is no way to practice religion without affecting the whole. Even if you understand your religion as something that is purely personal, in the words of the old feminist slogan, the personal is political. All of the choices that we make, what we eat, what we buy, who we talk to, the connections that we make, all of that has an impact on the world. We are an interdependent web. That's our seventh principle. And you know what? Our fifth principle as Unitarian Universalists is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. We've built it into our very language. Who we are is people who believe in making the world right according to our conscience. And we believe in the process that gives people a vote that gives people a say. And so the practice of religion involves affirming the use of that voice and that vote, whether it be through writing letters or protesting in the streets or calling your representatives or registering people to vote or voting or telling your friends how it is that you plan to vote, that's built into who we are as religious people. And so I like to remember one of my favorite phrases from the Hebrew Bible. It comes from the 58th chapter of Isaiah, verse 12, and it refers to us becoming repairers of the breach, restorers of streets to live in. Now it turns out Repairers of the Breach is the name of an excellent organization that you could be involved in, an organization that is absolutely based in the application of moral values to the process of government. Its president is Reverend Dr. William Barber, who you likely have heard of. And it's a great way to be involved. Repairers of the breach. But the part of the actual phrase from Isaiah that really gets to me is the restorers of streets to live in. It is, I think, what we are called to be in this broken and difficult world. Restorers of places where we meet, where we come together, where we talk, where we live, leave the safe enclaves that we reside inside and move out into the streets where we participate together in building our own salvation. I like to think of it as a kind of universal block party where we restore the streets to live in where we create a world that is founded in our religious values. And we create a world for all of us, all of us to live.